Hi, so I did a video previously on artificial muscles. It was while I was on holiday and in the videos there you can have a look. But it began me thinking about artificial muscles per se. Now, most materials will actually respond to a stimulus that is heat, light, uh, current through them, something like that. If you put a current through them, incidentally, it's mostly resistive heating, so it's, it's heat. Uh, if you shine light on them, mostly it's absorption of the light and, and the light heats the thing up, so again, it's heat. So a lot of these materials are actually just the application of heat to get some kind of response out of them. Now, most materials, as I say, will do that. So if you heat a metal, it will expand, and if you heat a plastic, it will contract. The problem with them is they're uncontrolled and they're not actually very large responses. What we're looking for really is a controlled large response. So I had a bit of, of a dig around really and a bit of a think about it. Now obviously uh, we're selling this stuff on the shop, which is a carbon black filled conductive high density polyethylene. So in theory, if I were to clip an electrode here, an electrode there, apply a current, then it should heat up and being plastic it should shrink. So that's where the thought began really, is that that material should respond that way. And so I did that, uh, and I have to say the response was um, disappointing to say the least. I found it quite disappointing, to be honest. But it did make me think, how could I stabilize that? And what I came up with was this, where I've taken a bit of that HDPE and I've applied a zinc coating to this side, which is just a thin metallic coating. And I've got here a uh, cup of hot water. And if I dip that in, you can see it's actually got a massive response to the application of heat. And as the thing cools down again, it expands out again. So we've got a material here that will give a large response to changes in temperature. And I thought that was super interesting, actually. So again, I had a look around, and I came across something that Ringstar.org did. Uh, and he made this, and he called it his sunflower motor. So what I've got here is a piece of this um, conductive high-density polyethylene, zinc coating on one side, cutting a daisy shape, suspended here. And on the application of heat, that will turn, and that's really quite cool. So what I thought I would do is a video on how to make that motor. So I've got here a piece of that HDPE. It's uh, 30 centimetres by 30 centimetres, and like I say, it's on sale in the shop if you want. And I'm going to um, make one of those motors out of this. And in order to do that, I have to electroplate it. Now, I've done a previous video on electroplating, and it's called wand plating. Again, have a look at it. And what we're going to use is this bright zinc wand plating solution. And surprise, surprise, this is, of course, on sale on the shop. So you can buy that, you can buy this, and you can follow along if you want. The other thing that we need is a bit of zinc. And again, we sell the squares of zinc on the shop. So the three main materials you need are the wand plating solution, the conductive HDPE, and a strip of zinc. If you acquire those, you can follow along with this. And we're going to make that motor. In order to make that motor, I need a protractor and a ruler. And the motor actually has a uh, diameter of 20 centimeters. So if I set this at 10 centimeters and draw myself a circle, And that is the basics of that rotor. Now in the centre of that rotor, I have a piece of card. And that card has a diameter of 8 centimetres. So I set the radius at 4 centimetres. And draw the inner diameter. And now I'm going to cut that out.
go. What I need to do is electroapply it or zinc coat that bit around the edge. The center doesn't matter, but the bit around the edge is the bit that I need to coat. And as I say, I've done a video on wand plating. If you want some more detail on that, then have a look at that video. In order to do that, I've set up my ground plate. <coughs> I've connected the ground plate to the negative. I'll be connecting the zinc to the positive. And here's a strip of zinc wrapped in a little bit of cloth that I'm going to be using as my wand, which basically I'm going to wrap around my finger and rub on that, and that'll be connected to the positive. Now, I've been handling that, which is not in itself a bad thing, but it does leave grease marks on it. We don't want grease marks because they'll be a little difficult to play. If you don't want to clean it, then by all means don't. You'll just get these little finger marks, and I don't think it matters that much. But this is a little bit of isopropanol alcohol, and we just clean off those grease marks that we just put on. There we go, and that'll clean up the grease marks. As I say, this is actually stunningly easy to do. It's incredible, actually, how easy it is. And it happens actually very quickly, which is also quite cool. Now, I'm going to connect this to the positive. So it's the metal you're donating to the positive. The thing that you're wanting to coat in metal goes to the negative. I've set my voltage here at 10 volts. It happens quite quickly, and it leaves a nice bright zinc right the way up to a 20 or 30 volts. What will happen is this wire will get hot because it pulls a lot of ampage. And you notice I'm wearing gloves because although the electroplating solution, the wand placing solution is pretty safe, you still don't want to be dipping your hands in stuff when you're doing this. And we've got a live current at 10 volts, we don't want little shocks. And if you do overdo it, it does get a bit hot, but then just turn the voltage down. It'll happen at very low voltages, it just takes longer. At very high voltages, it's actually very rapid. And we wet this bit of material with our zinc plating solution, our wand plating bright zinc solution. And again, that's for sale in the shop. And you can either wet the material or pour a little bit on it. It really doesn't matter. And you don't use that much per application. Then all you do is apply that. And you will almost immediately see a voltage being drawn, an ampage being drawn on your meter and a gray coating going onto the surface of that. And it's really quick. It'll take probably five to ten minutes to plate that. So I'm going to plate it and then get back to you. So after about ten minutes of wand plating it, what you'll end up with is this nice, bright, shiny circle. So that circle is HDP on one side and a thin metallic plating of zinc on the other. And that's what we're going to use to make our rotor. give that a bit of a clean. And mark it up. And to mark it up, we're going to use a protractor, a pen, a ruler. As I draw from edge to edge of a circle passing through the centre, and we mark that when we actually drew the centre, then that is a diameter. And now I want to mark that off with the protractor. And we want 22 and a half. 45, 67 and a half, 90, 110, 0.25, 135, 157 and a half. So you mark them round like that, join up that line with the centre point. and they'll be opposite each other.
there we go, it's marked out for the leaves. So we're ready to cut into that now to create those leaves. In order to get something to fix there though, and give it enough stability, we want a piece of card. And I'm going to use the back of this sketch pad. I haven't moved that since I drew that centre square, so that's going to be pretty good. Just make sure I can get it on the card. Yep. And I've got my centre marked. And I'm going to cut that out and pop it there. In order to stick that on there, I've got some double-sided tape. Now I can put a circle. Line that up. And that's my rotor. Now these marks are at 22 and a half degrees each. So you can either measure the next bit Oh, I just judged it by eye. And that is halfway between those, put another mark. So we end up with a mark halfway between each two of those lines. In order to trim that out, again, you can either measure it, but I didn't. What I did was just put the ruler against the mark that I just made and adjusted it so that it was in line with the line that I previously drew, and then take a knife and cut it out. And then on the opposite side, at the same mark, but this time in line with that line, What you end up doing is cutting out a little wedge, like that. By the time you've gone round all of that, what you will have done is cut straight shapes all the way out of that. Because on this one, what we'll do is exactly the same thing. At that mark I made, line it up. Cut, swap it round, same mark, but line it up with this line this time. And we could add a lot of wedge shapes, but we make these little petals. Now I'm going to do the rest so of So what you end up with when you've done that is this thing, and it looks just like a daisy, and that's pretty much ready to go. So that's the rotor, and you'll notice I'm just pulling those leaves through my fingers gently. Don't pull too hard or you'll tear one off, and then you'll be very disappointed after putting all that effort in. But just give them a gentle pull through your fingers to curl them inwards a little bit towards the metal side. And that makes the rotor. Now what we're going to do is put the rotor on a stator, and here's the stator. All it is is a couple of bits of aluminium screwed to a wooden block. 
And here I've put a punch hole. I just use a nail or whack the nail, put a little hole, a little indentation in the aluminium there. So we have two strips of aluminium. And then I've got a sewing needle. And the sewing needle fits into that little indentation. And these magnets here that I've sellotaped onto there hold it in place. And this bank of magnets here keep that thing in place because there's not a lot of power in this motor. And that's a relatively low friction bearing that the rotor will be able to spin on. And we want to spin that rotor. So we feed the darning needle in through that paper in the center that we put, trying to keep it square, and just feed it in. Ouch, careful not to jab your finger. <laughs> feed it in, try to make it relatively square, and then we can put the rotor into the stator. There we go. And that'll just hang there. Now what we need to do is balance it, because when that settles down, it's going to settle down always with one point, because you didn't make this super, super well. So it's always going to be one point. You see it rocking back and forward with that one there, meaning that is slightly too heavy. So we need to balance it by putting a little weight on. And the weight is really simple. It's just a piece of tape. And this is gaffer tape, and you don't use huge chunks of it. And opposite where it's resting, pop a little bit of tape on as a, to help balance the thing. And then you keep doing that until you can move it in position and it stays in the position you moved it. So here we can see that it still wants to return to the top there, so it's still too heavy. Still going. Hmm. Just checking that's in line. There we go. If it's not in line, move the magnets, it'll make the needle in line. You don't need massive bits of tape. I'm surprised how much heavier that is. Still. There we go, pretty much there. Now we need something to drive it. It is a heat engine, so it uses heat. If it were a sunny day, which unfortunately it's not, we could take it out in the sunshine and the sunshine would do it. What I'm going to do is I've got a tungsten 60 watt tungsten filament lamp here. I'm going to plug the lamp in, hold it close to that, and we should see that spin. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That is very cool. So you can see that the daisy leaves curling over as it's near to the heat source, the light source. When it goes to the other side, they uncurl, it creates an bal unbalanced wheel, and that will continue to rotate. I actually thought that was awesome. So I hope you've enjoyed that, and thank you very much for watching. Hmm. <laughs>